will grace to you in peace from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. This week we're continuing on our course through the Creed and our the I Believe sermon series. And our goal and hope for this series is that you take a moment each Sunday and consider this rather simple question, or seemingly simple question. Who is the God that we are here to worship? We begin our worship in his name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We call out to his name in prayer and song. We seek forgiveness in God's name, and we thank God for all that is ours. But despite how much we use the name, do we consider the God to whom we cry out to? Have you taken time to prayerfully reflect on the who of who our God is? Think for a moment to the impossible nature of this task that we're setting out to do. That through the creeds, through our limited human language, we are trying to describe infinite vastness. We are trying to wrap our words around a God that has existed before creation. A God of perfection, of infinite power and might, yet a God of grace and love. A God whose understanding is far above our own, yet also a God who desires to connect with us and speak with him. Someone so infinite and vast, yet accessible by a child in prayer. I think the mystery of our God really begins to set in when you're asked by someone outside of the faith to describe the God that we worship. Would you respond if someone asked you a question like that? How would you respond? Would you consider his actions in the Bible to describe him? Say he's the one who brought about the exodus. He is the one who brought about the cross or the saving of the world. Would you point to the words that we often use to describe him? All-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, merciful. Where do you begin when God is so infinitely vast, yet close and personal with his people? This is why we're taking the time to study the creed. They do not take away that mystery of God and explain everything for us. The creed does not project what you and I think about who God might be onto him, nor does the creed offer just another idea of what God could be in the midst of thousands of religions and philosophies. The creed does something different. The creed instead tells us who God says that he is. It tells us how God has chosen to reveal himself and his vastness to you and me throughout the pages of Scripture. It doesn't take away the mystery, but invites you and I to engage with God on his own terms at his own invitation. And through the biblical witness, the creed delivers to you and to me a personal God who is infinite and vast, the who of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Last week we saw how the infinite Father reveals himself to the world. We heard we have a Father who is God and a God who we can call Father. That together as his people we have been adopted into his family. That he reveals himself to be our Heavenly Father. One who is always giving us good gifts and caring for his children. We also have a God who is a Father who is always open to us coming to him. Who desires to know us and love us. This week we turn to that second article of the Creed and we're invited to ponder about God the Son, Jesus the Christ. And for us in church, who is Jesus is a question of the utmost importance because of his work of salvation. And for some of us in church today, our knowledge of the who behind Jesus is rather limited. Maybe you are new to the faith or maybe it's a question you've just never really pondered, but the who behind Jesus beyond the title of Savior might be unknown to you. And for other of us, we are on the other end of the spectrum. There are those in the church who have spent considerable time learning the what about Jesus, who he is and what he's done, the verses, and all of the different things that point to who Christ our Lord is. But the amazing truth of our creed is that God is always more than we think he is. He always is just a little bit beyond what our mind can comprehend and perceive. And as we turn to the creed and we ask who this Jesus is, we're not led into our own minds. 
But instead, again, we are led to how Jesus has revealed himself to us in Scripture. And here, once again, we are told the story of what Jesus has done for us. And through this story, we don't just learn facts about Jesus. We get an image of God's infinite and beautiful heart. We get to see what his character is like. The vastness of his love for you and for me. And what lengths God would go through to save us from our sin. Through the story of Jesus we find in the creed, we discover truly who our God is that we worship today. And this story takes you and I into a rather unexpected place. Where our usual definitions of God talk about his power and might, his infinite vastness, or even his all-knowing nature, Christ does something different. Christ our Lord reveals himself not through divine power and trumpets and angels and glory, but rather through the lowering of himself, through his own humiliation, as we'll come to call it. Hear the story of Jesus in our creed. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and he bar- and was buried. The story that the creed tells us about Jesus is one of descent. Christ our Lord descends from the heavenly bodies where he was in perfect communion with God the Father and Spirit. Christ comes down from heaven and joins us in our world. Ponder for a moment just how much our Lord gives up to join us in creation. As our Philippians verse tells us, Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. From the highest rung of the ladder to the lowest rung of the ladder, Christ our Lord descends from heaven to earth. From the perfection of the heavens to the reality of our everyday existence, how is he like a servant? He puts the needs of his people over and above himself. He descends not for his own glory, but for you and for me and for our salvation. He empties himself of his wondrous power and glory and is made man, like you and I. He becomes like that which he is going to save. What a mystery. The infinite and vast God has become human. and has taken on our flesh and has lowered himself, the infinite God of the universe, to be an infant in Mary's arms. What a mystery to ponder. What a humiliation for God. Yet he does all this out of love for his fallen creation. The story continues that as he has taken on our flesh, that he has been born as one of us while still being the infinite God of the universe. Christ lowers himself to experience all that the world is. To experience suffering in a sinful and broken world to the fullest extent. Each and every one of us suffers in this sinful world. We all experience pain, we all experience sorrow, we mourn, we weep, we find ourselves in need, and we ourselves add to the broken nature of this world through our own sinfulness. We hurt others through our words and deeds, we add to the suffering through our hurting and harming of our neighbor. It's this pit of despair this place of sadness and mourning that Christ our Lord willingly lowers himself into. He descends from the heavens, from the wonders and joy of what it means to be in communion with God, to be here with us in this place. Hear what that experience was like from Isaiah. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our our iniquities. 
Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Notice that Jesus joins us in our sorrows. As we remember the story throughout the gospel, we remember times where he is hungry, where he experiences suffering and evil, even pain and suffering of his own. He weeps at the death of his friends. Yet, as we imagine and think through our own sufferings, that suffering is placed on our Lord's shoulders as well. Christ our Lord willingly descends into this place with us. He willingly suffers on our behalf that he might save us. What a humiliation for God, yet he does this out of love for his fallen creation. And the story of his humiliation ends with Christ being perfectly obedient despite the suffering and the vastness of what he bears on his shoulders. Our gospel reading tells us Jesus prayed saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. For all of us failed to be perfect sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father, Christ our Lord, by descending to us, taking our place, taking on our flesh, suffering in our midst, has kept his perfect obedience. He has done what you and I could not do. And as Philippians tells us, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death upon a cross. Christ our Lord, the man of many sorrows, the man of guilt and shame, dies in our place. Christ willingly descends into our place of sin and despair. He willingly suffers alongside of us and bears the burdens of our disobedience and sin. Then that same Christ willingly suffers death in a brutal fashion, death upon a cross, that the sin and the evil of this world and our own would be borne on his shoulders and put to death as he dies. That those he has come to serve might be free from the reign of death. That their sin might be forgiven. What a humiliation for God. Yet he does all of this out of love for his fallen creation. Out of love for you and for me. This is who our God is. This is the heart of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A love for you and me that would drive God to lower himself from the heavenly places for you. A God that would suffer all, not only in his own flesh, but suffer the sin and pain of the world for you. A God that would die a brutal death upon the cross for you. That the people he loves dearly, you and me, might be free from the consequences of their own sin. This, this is who our God is. A God who will lower himself, go into a state of humiliation that you and I might be restored. What a mystery, the greatness of his love for you and for me, that he would suffer all, even death, that you and I would not die eternally. This is the love that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share for each and every one of us. It's this God that we worship today. It is this God who proclaims his love for you in this service as he forgives your sins, as he gathers you for the sacraments. It is this God we cling to until he comes again in glory. And it's in this God, a God who loves us beyond our wildest imagination, that we trust in until we see him again. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.